I can't say how highly I think of this idea of having a civic series. I think it's an absolutely terrific idea. I, I've seen some of the things on the web. It's outstanding and, and best wishes to continue success with this because it's a really cool thing to do and important thing to do. So I'm going to talk about the elections of uh, uh, 2016. Uh, I don't have very, you know, they're not the most sophisticated slides you'll ever see because uh, I'm not that sophisticated a guy. I don't have a photo of Donald Trump, I realize, in the lab. So uh, it would be an unusual presentation in that respect, at least for this year. Uh, but Borg did ask me if I could talk about a few uh, particular things, uh, and I'll try and get to the all, oh, sorry, yeah. number of them today. Let me see if I can do that. Yeah, crazy. How's that going to work? Aha! How it works and so forth, and caucuses and primaries and all this stuff, um, the party events. It's changed a lot of these. The first thing is the founders really didn't want to have parties. The founders disliked parties, they suspected them, they thought they were permanent factions, they didn't want to have them at all, as reflected by what Thomas Jefferson said. But by 1800, Jefferson was leading the party. Uh, and um, so it was pretty inevitable we quickly moved into it. Um, political scientists talk about six, usually sometimes four or five party systems. I'm not going to talk about them all. Just so you're aware that uh, there have been various iterations of a party system over the years. The Federalists were around for a while. Our own John Adams was a Federalist. Hamilton was a Federalist and so forth. The, the, the race of 1800, Jefferson against Adams, was a Federalist. Adams against, who was the president at the time, against Thomas Jefferson, who was the leader of the book called the Democratic Republicans. So there were those, that, that system. Years later, along came the Whigs. Uh, Henry Clay was the head of the ticket uh, a couple of times. You'll see that one, on one occasion he was running on no extension of slavery, and then the Whigs died out. Uh, and in 1856, we wound up having the Republican Party replace the Whigs, and we've had Republicans and Democrats ever since. The, you know, the, the former Thomas Nast cartoon, I think, developed it. The donkey uh, is the Democrat, and the, the elephant uh, is the Republican. So we've had that system in place for a long time now. They followed in the different party systems, but we don't really need to get to that. But what we're talking about today, we probably just want to talk about the modern era, what we call the post-reform era in uh, politics. And we'll start with this figure, who is Hubert Humphrey, who was the Democratic nominee for president in 1968. And you might consider his nomination somewhat outrageous today, because Hubert Humphrey not only didn't win any primaries, he didn't enter any primaries. <laughs> None, right? Uh, there were primaries that year. They were won by either Robert Kennedy or Eugene McCarthy. Uh, but they, were, you know, Humphrey got the nomination at the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968 without having even entered a primary. He was the Vice President of the United States. Uh, he ran on the ticket with Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Johnson decided not to run in 1968. He could have run again. He decided not to because. Uh, of the huge controversy and protests over the Vietnam War. So Johnson backed out as vice president wound up getting the nomination. Now, that's important because you know a lot of Americans think of politics as being conducted in smoke-filled back rooms like this cartoon. Well, that is actually what happened in 1968, but most of the time before that. That's what we did. That's how we did it. Uh, it was conducted in smoke-filled back rooms. So let me talk a little bit about 1968 which was really one of the worst years politically you, know, you could ever imagine. Uh, Dr. King was assassinated, uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated uh, on the night of the California primary, which he won. It was really a terrible year. Uh, and then in Chicago, the convention really capped out what was politically a really disastrous time. So the Democrats go to Chicago for their national convention, and it's, it's just bad. Uh, there are police riots outside, uh, protesters in Grant Park beaten by police, who uh, 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 were commanded by this guy over here, Richard Daly. He was the boss of a longtime mayor of Chicago, uh, and it was just, it was a mess. Uh, there were protesters for, against Vietnam, there were protesters in favor of women's rights, in favor of civil rights. It, 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 was, it was really awful. And as you can see, uh, 800 in National Guard aid cops were Mall for hippies in those days. Uh, so it was a real mess out in Grant Park. Uh, and it just added to people's unhappiness with the political process because it was people like Daly who were in the back room selecting delegates to the convention. There were, from, from, as I mentioned, there were some primaries, 
Uh, but they didn't really determine who the delegates to the convention were going to be. The delegates to the convention were really determined by party leaders in the 50 states, including Mayor Daley, who would choose who the delegates were going to be, and the delegates would then be holding to the lead. So, you know, you might be the Ward 22 coordinator of Chicago, or you might be the head of the transportation or the parking department, or something like that. And Daley would say, you, you're a loyal guy. Most of the guys. Uh, you know, I'm sending you to the convention, but the voting, I'll tell you how to vote. And that's really uh, what happened. So the convention nominated uh, Hubert Humphrey and his vice presidential candidate was Ed Muskie from Maine. Uh, they lost in 1968 uh, to Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. But out of this entire disaster, really, of in Chicago, uh, there came uh, people my age mostly lived in black and white for many, many years. Uh, now things are better. Uh, but what came out of that convention was a determination that things had to change. Democrats were going to have to reform. And the head of the Reform Commission was this man, this man named Senator George McGovern, a liberal senator from South Dakota. In fact, he knew the rules so well by 1972 that he became the nominee for president. He lost 49 states to Richard Nixon. Uh, anyway, uh, McGovern and another fellow named Frazier formed the McGovern Frazier Committee Commission. Uh, and they reformed the, the process by which the Democrats would nominate uh, candidates for president. Okay? So, one of the first and most important things they did was primaries and caucuses. So now the primaries were really tough. Now, it won't be bosses in the back room who will choose the delegates. It will be we, the people, by our vote, who will determine which candidates get how many delegates to the convention in our state by our own votes. Talk a little bit more about the rules of this in a minute. And parties could pick to do a primary or a caucus. Most of them chose to do primaries. Okay? Uh, the states did, I should say. Uh, so this really you know, was meant to and did back the bosses out of the process and give more of the process over to the votes. Yeah. Um, was it the state the government that made the decision to do primaries, or was it the, part, the, the party at the state level? Important question. Most of the state houses at that time were under control of the Democrats, legislatures and governments. So the Democrats, in order to comply with the new Democratic National Committee rules, changed their systems locally. Other, if you didn't comply with the rules, your delegates wouldn't be counted at the convention. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't get representation at the convention. So in, in essence, the Democratic National Committee forced this upon the states. And for the most part, Republicans went along with it. The Democrats were changing the rules, they changed the Republicans too. Even in Republican states, this all changed. So now we had a system that was mostly focused on primaries and caucuses. Okay. So that's the first big change that came out of this that really altered things. And the second one was that with all the agitation of the 60s, right, people were demanding to participate. And the Democrats turned around and changed their rules to assure participation by women, uh, African Americans, and other minority groups, the poor, and young people. Okay? They actively set aside delegate positions in each of these groups. In fact, Democratic delegations have to be half male, half female. Okay? In the Mayor Daley days, you know, that all be white guys named Jimmy and Bob and Sal, right? Uh, but now uh, the Democrats require to have since uh, 72 uh, that half the delegates be women. They, they, they actively uh, set aside seats for African Americans. Uh, the poor uh, aspect has never worked out the way it really should have. Uh, but you know, the, the young people uh, have been, uh, you know, they've gone back and forth over the years, uh, who do they support? But young people are, it's a really important part of Obama's coalition in 2008, 2012. Uh, not only for their vote contribution to him, but the fact that turnout has risen among the young with Obama. He's been really important. So these reforms have a lot of important consequences. All right, now, you know, we have primaries and we have caucuses. Primary is, you know, the same, you know, we go, we go down, and the, the polling place is open from 7 in the morning or 8 in the evening. Sometimes it's convenient for you, or if it's not, you go to have some tea or you go now by mail or a lot of places. But traditionally, you go down sometime in those 13 hours. Uh, you present your ID, or you, know, you tell them who you are, uh, they give you a ballot, you vote, you get your little sticker that says, I vote, and you belong, okay? Uh, simple process. Caucuses are really different. 
Uh, caucuses are party-run affairs, basically. State law allows the parties to do this. Um, and you've got to be somewhere at a specific time in a specific place. It's not just going to a poll. So you might come to a place like this. This would be a great caucus. Uh, and the ward chair or the town chair will conduct the meeting. Uh, and it will be open only to party members. Primaries are interesting in that some of them are open to party members, some of them are open to independents and party members, some of them are open to everybody. Caucuses are only open to party members. Uh, and instead of going in and putting the ballot down, you go in, the, you know, the chair will give everybody the rules, representatives of the candidates will have an opportunity to speak for a couple of minutes, and then you wind up, the chair will say, okay, all you point people, you're in that corner, uh, let's see, the O'Malley folks will put you over there, the Sanders folks will put you over here, and you, you're publicly declaring me a foreigner. You head off to your corner. And at that point, the chair looks up and says, the O'Malley people don't, you, get, you have to have 15% to get it done. I don't know how it is. The chair looks up and says, uh, you O'Malley people and you few uncommitted people over there, you don't have enough to get a delegate. If you want to go to one of the other two, you can do it now. And you go troop it over to Hillary or you go troop it over to Sanders. And eventually they make a count and decide who's won the most delegates out of that caucus. And then it goes on. And this is how delegates choose. So it's an entirely different kind of process. Caucuses are really you know, an unusual thing for a lot Why do we even have them? They're kind of a legacy in some ways of the old way of doing things. But they're also, party members think that they're important to preserve party influence, preserve the importance of those who are out there every year really, uh, voting the party's goals and voting interests. Uh, party building, if you show up at one of these things, the parties will hopefully recruit you to be active. Right? So it's important there. Um, and it, it, it's a big advantage for insiders and people who are really well organized. And it disadvantages people who are just casual participants, people who, who are working that hour, right? If you're working that hour, you can't go to the conference. Uh, it, it, it's disadvantage to disabled people. Uh, a little bit, and it's elite nature like the electoral college. But we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. What's the purpose of keeping it so that everyone has to publicly declare where they are? So I can see all of these yeah. interests, but why anonymity? Why hasn't that been added to a conference? Yeah, well that's a, I'm not entirely sure of all of it. It's a tradition to hold them open. Um, uh, there's vote shifting afterwards. Um, there's a lot of uh, politicking in caucuses. And so people go back and forth. Not, not a lot of it, but there is some. And it is an interesting thing. You know, it's, you're a party member, you declare them before. So I think there's that part of the tradition. Uh, it's kind of an interesting and exciting thing uh, to do, really. We, you know, here in Massachusetts, we have caucuses. The Democrats have caucuses, and the Republicans have caucuses. Go to the apartment kind of cool thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, delegates and super delegates. It's asked me to say a little bit about that. Uh, it's a tradition among delegates to wear funny hats. That's why I have these delegates who love funny hats. It's one of the cool things about the convention. In fact, I was at a state party convention a couple of years ago, uh, uh, and uh, there were no funny hats. It was really, we were in the press pen. They put bloggers in the press pen, and we were like, oh man, this is funny hat. It's the same thing. This is cool. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the delegates, and then these super delegates we hear so much about that the Bernie Sanders people do not like very much at all. And even Elizabeth Warren says, I'm a super delegate, and I even get super delegates. So we'll talk about that too. Okay. Uh, the delegates. So each party has its uh, own rules for allocation of number of delegates from each state, or from each congressional district from each state. And the, the rules vary between parties. It, it sort of has to do with how many delegates you get. Uh, what's your vote contribution for president and governor to the party, uh, how many people in the state, th things of that nature, how the party performs in the state uh, can vary the number of delegates you get. But each, each state gets a, gets a number of delegates to the national uh, convention. And then on the first ballot, you are bound to vote. That was the only non-kinky picture with bounding I could get. <laughs> so, uh, so you are bound on the first vote. For, as an elected delegate, you are bound on the first ballot to vote for the candidate you were elected to represent. Okay? So if you are a Trump delegate, you must vote Trump. Or, or if you were, you're a delegate representing a district that voted in favor of Trump, then you have to vote for Trump. Uh, and I say that because the rules are that after the first ballot, you get, up, you get unbound. You can now vote for any candidate you want. We haven't gone to a second ballot. Gosh, I don't know how long. 
many, many, many years. Uh, but it's a, it's a possibility. There's a lot of talk this year that maybe the death of Republicans would go, you know, the, the, the stop Trump movement was, let's try and block him at the convention. If he doesn't get the, the if he doesn't get the number of delegates he needs to win a majority on the first ballot, we could beat him on the second ballot. Because a lot of those people who were elected as Trump voters don't really like Trump all much. But they're bound by the party rules to vote for him. So that's sort of what uh, uh, the delegates do who are elected there. This applies to both parties. Uh, Democrats are bound on the first ballot, Republicans are bound on the first ballot, if they are elected through the primary caucus system. Now, uh, ah, here's something else about delegates. I put this, this means nothing other than to remind me to talk about this. Uh, who are the delegates? Uh, we, you know, there's a whole, there are a lot, a lot of studies that profile them. I don't, can't go into all of them. But delegates in both parties tend to be further out to the extremes than regular party members. So the delegates to the Democratic Convention uh, are coming up in Philadelphia, two weeks, right? Uh, will be further to the left than other Democrats and certainly the general public. So they'll be further to the left on abortion, on environmental matters. The labor delegates will be uh, concerned with labor issues and so forth. They'll be further out there. Because people who go to these things tend to be highly committed and they tend to be ideological. And on the Republican side, same thing. Republican delegates are far more conservative than Republicans in the electorate on issues uh, like abortion, same-sex marriage, free markets, you name it. Okay? So there is something important to know about these delegates. I mean, and interesting to know about them. Super delegates. Uh, super delegates are another Democratic Party reform. So we had the reforms of 72, right? Uh, after 68, we had the reforms of 72. Uh, in 72, George McGovern. Uh, is the nominee for the Democratic Party, and he loses 49 states uh, to Richard Nixon. This is why uh, you don't see them anymore, but around here we used to all have these wonderful bumper stickers we put on our cars that said, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts. That's because we were the only state that voted for McGovern. And we felt good about it. So the Democrats had another set of reforms going into 76, another set of reforms going into 80. They kept losing, but they did win 76. Uh, but things really weren't working right. And after 80, the Reform Commission that time said, what we need, instead of having all these amateurs come in, we should kind of leaven that and balance it out with people who are in the party regularly and who care about the party and who work about the party, work for the party every day of their lives. We'll have them come in and kind of leaven out this uh, unruly law that's becoming these conventions. So now it's... Uh, uh, I think the chair, the, 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 the state representatives of the Democratic National Committee, I would super delegates, uh, distinguished former, so former office holders, don't put this one for life, you know, unless they change the rule. Uh, U.S. Senators, Congressmen, and governors. These folks are not bound to vote for any candidate. They make up their own vote. Practically over the years, they've always gone with whoever the leader is in the vote club. But this was another source of controversy between Sanders and Clinton. Sanders was saying, you're getting all these superdelegates, that's why you need so many. You know, in fact, she was winning more states and more votes and so forth. But big source of confidence. Uh, they're not so lovable in some ways. People think that the system is rigged for the insiders, these superdelegates, right? It's undemocratic. I mean, uh, we the people are, you know, there's 571 superdelegates this year. That's a lot of delegates. And, you know, they're not representative of us, the people. Uh, so it may be that this is a rule that will be changed in some way. There are a lot of people who want to change it. Even Elizabeth Warren, who is a super bit Conventions are coming up in the next two weeks. They're supposed to look like this, okay? Happy candidates, that's Mitt Romney up there, uh, uh, Biden and uh, Obama down there. Balloons, lights, red, white, and blue, patriotic music. It all looks great. It's all a huge television show is what it is. Boy, oh, boy. It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> the, the Republican one may not be so boring. Uh, but, you know, um, because they don't decide, because the real decision has been made in the primaries and caucuses, and therefore the drama is on it. We already know who's going to win. In 1924, the Democrats, I think, with 128 ballots. You know, before they determine who they nominee would be. But now we determine largely in the front in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, primaries and caucuses. But the Democrats, both parties want to see them look something like that. You know? uh, uh, 
unity, harmony, and all that other stuff. So we'll get that in the next two weeks or something. I don't know what's going to happen in the next week, but I think the Democrats are going to look a little bit more like the bunting and all the rest of that stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I always have a question. When you say bound, I know it's the party rule, but if someone, a delegate, not a super delegate, the delegate were to vote out to not follow the rule, does something happen to them? Like, are they kicked out? Are they, how, what prevents them from actually following up, from not following 68 the rule? 68 back in Chicago will take them up back to people. Uh, mm -hmm. No, you'd be disqualified. Okay. Yeah. You, it, it, this is called the problem of the faithless delegation. <laughs> but it doesn't really happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're you. bound. And, you know, there are alternate delegates, and if you, if you're a faithless delegate, they say, I'm sorry, you, you have, we're disqualifying you, next person down. Yes. Um, I read about how the Trump delegates that uh, you mentioned are maybe going to try to not elect him. Yeah. But he got a majority of delegates that are bound, correct? They are bound, yep. Yeah. So how would they do that on the first ballot with not voting for him? Boy, they've had so many futile efforts uh, to, to try and deny him the nomination. The only way to do it now, and they really don't have a chance, I think it's called Rule 40, they would, they, which, would, which would unbind the delegates. Uh, but they're not going to get anywhere with that rule. That's not going to change. I mean, there are still people trying. How would they pass that rule? Uh, <coughs> you would have, uh, right now, there are already meetings in Cleveland. You know, the, the pop and all that stuff doesn't begin next week. But the platform committee is meeting, the rules committee is meeting. You'd have to push something through the rules committee okay. for a change. But, I, I don't think that's even happening. I don't think it's a lie. It's talked about. It has been talked about, but I don't think it's been a lie issue. Is there another question? Yeah. Um, how are delegates chosen? Like, I don't understand. Like, who are they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, oftentimes political, mostly political activists. Uh, it's an odd thing. You know, I'll give you an example here. Well, I'll give you the Colorado example. Uh, Colorado had a primary, I think it was, that went for Trump for the most part, you got most of the delegates. But they didn't choose the actual living human beings who would be the delegates in the primary. That came later at a caucus uh, in the state. And this was at a time when the Stop Trump movement was still saying, maybe we can prevent him from winning on the first ballot. So a few weeks later, they held these caucuses, and Trump really wasn't very well organized. Caucuses reward people who are well organized. Uh, so uh, Colorado had its caucuses, and Cruz, who was well organized, a lot of evangelicals, very well organized group, uh, flooded the caucuses and elected delegates who are now bound to Trump on the first ballot, but will bolt to Cruz on the second ballot if he can get to a second ballot. Okay? So that sort of thing happens. It's happened here in Massachusetts too. But I mentioned Colorado because Trump went wild. I mean, he's just, you know, it's great. It's just, no, Donald, read the rules. You gotta understand the rules. Uh, <laughs> you just did. Yes. But who, who's electing those delegates? Choosing the delegates? The, the, uh, the, the, the uh, interested Coloradans who are registered Republican. I'm attending a caucus, something like this. Could be in a room like this. Your, your Republican, registered Republicans, you are now going to come and determine which among us, uh, usually from the interest groups that back. A party on the Republican side that would be, uh, you know, evangelicals for Cruz, uh, Tea Parties, other groups. Uh, I'm going to stand for election. So you're going to stand for election. A few of us, and we'll, we, we as a caucus, the Republicans in this area, will determine. Uh, we've got four delegates. We'll decide <coughs> we're going to okay, from among this group. So usually party activists. So they're weird events like that, but you know, this is the way it's done in politics. Now, like four years ago, uh, when Mitt Romney was the nominee here, we had a process like this here. And people who were loyal to uh, Ron Paul, libertarian, they're very excited about Ron Paul. So Romney wins the state the primary, but then we have caucuses here in Massachusetts. So the Republicans of like the 6th Congressional District, they have the 6th CD thing to, to pick this, the eight people who are going to go, and the Libertarians, the Ron, the Ron Paul people, flood the thing, and they, and, they, and, they win the, and they win the delegates. They're still bound to vote for Romney, but they can go and play around and mess with the platform and other things. They denied a delegate seat to an active Republican in the, in the 6th District uh, who was running for delegate. They denied him a chance to go to the convention. His name was Charlie Baker. <laughs> Bumped him right up. And Charlie, to his great credit, said, I got beat. That's it. I'm not raising a fuck about this. So it's really big. Is there a or appointed? 
they are elected black, elected in a small group like this. So this, we're in the 8th Congressional District here in Massachusetts, <coughs> which is like 600,000 people, 750,000 people, I lost track. Uh, and among those people, the Democrats were in Independence when voted in the primary uh, and so forth and awarded you know, five of the six delegates to Hillary Clinton. Uh, but we, as the Democrats of the, of the 6th Congressional District, so like a month later, I gather them like this and say, okay, what six is it going to be? Okay. We need three men, we need three women, but six is it going to be? Okay. And we, we, we vote on them. Yeah. Yes, sir. Like, how do I specifically get on the ballot to become a delegate? Like, I want to be a delegate. What do, okay. I, what do I do? Uh, you, uh, the best way to do it is you find out from your state party where uh, the caucus is in your party, in your congressional district, say. Uh, and you start organizing to go there because you need to bring some people. Okay. Uh, so is any anybody who's registered in that registered party, member registered like, in hey, that district? Get your friends. And yeah. Go. Bring your friends. I mean, it rewards the organized. So like labor people are often will organize the Democratic Party. You bring a lot of labor people because they do this all the time. They know how to do it. Even in and the Republican Party, it's you know it's kind of it's a little bit of an inside game. But it's kind of a porous system too, so you can get well organized and get in. Yes, sir. back there now. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So I understand one way in which um, the GOP delegates could possibly prevent Trump from getting the nomination is to, um, so like while, while they're on the floor during the actual convention, to propose a uh, rule change. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of like the delegate threshold needed for first ballot. Yeah. Um, to like two thirds, for instance. Yeah. Um, and you would need a majority in order to get that passed, correct? You so need like, a majority to pass it. Yeah. So like, I, like, seems unlikely, but what, what are the chances you think that something like that could occur? It doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. There's been some, you know, there were people who wanted to do it. They kind of organized, they held some meetings, but it fell flat. Yeah. It's really hard. Can you imagine going down? You know, I mean, things have there have been vi there's been violence at rallies already. Heaven knows we don't need more violence in this country anytime soon. But can you imagine going down to Cleveland and denying Trump the nomination? <laughs> Boy, I wouldn't want to see the scene in, inside that arena or outside the arena. It's just very difficult to do. I think. You know, it's not going to happen. There were efforts to try and do it. It's just not going to happen. Yes, I'm sorry. So, um you can have as many people as you want at a caucus, but the number of delegates is defined by... Yeah, the number of delegates is pretty true. But you can, like, tweet out, come on over to such and such a place. Yeah. Massive amounts of people. Oh, who, 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 who's, I'm drawing a place. Who was I talking to? Brookline. Yeah. Go to a Brookline Democratic caucus. It's like, you got to hold it in an airplane language. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right? <Thank> you. <laughs> and there are other places, you walk in with two of your friends, guess what? You're the three delegates. But they're a really good thing. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, but Brookline is, you really have to go to this Brookline. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, yeah, Laura. Can, can you explain a little bit about how the delegate votes compare to public votes? I'm still not quite sure. I mean, whenever I see polls or yeah. the results, you know, you see kind of the results in yeah. percentage wise, and on top of that, you've seen delegates and super delegates. I'm not quite sure how they compare. The, the, the Democrats and Republicans have different systems for the elements. And the, the Democrats have what's called a proportional representation system. Uh, in which if you get 15% of the votes in the congressional district, we have nine congressional districts here in Massachusetts, we're in the eighth. If you as a candidate, a presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders, McConnell O'Malley, and just to be an example, and Hillary Clinton, uh, if O'Malley who was out by then, by 15% here in the 8th Congressional District, he would be entitled to one delegate. Okay? Because it's a PR system. It rewards doing at least minimally well. Below 15%, you get nothing. Uh, and then the rest of the delegates would roughly be allocated between Clinton and Sanders. Often wound up then 50-50 or, you know, uh, whatever. You, know, you might have done. You may, maybe Clinton wipes out Sanders in this district and gets most of the delegates. But as long as you get 15%, you get one. So uh, they're allocated that way. The super delegates are a different story. We, we, you know going in who the super delegates are because you know who the Democratic governors, senators, reps are, and the DNC members, and we have an ex-president who lives in the state. 
But uh, so you know who the superdelegates are. You don't quite know how uh, the primary itself will determine how many delegates are allocated uh, in e out of each CD toward the Democratic Convention. Republicans run some PR and some winner take all. So if you win, like, you know, they're, 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 I think California was winner take all. I think. Uh, you win California by one vote, you get all the delegates from California in the Republican Party. So they have, the parties have their own rules. Yes. So two questions. One being, um, like, why we haven't sort of standardized how delegates and stuff look so that yeah. it's not different in California versus here, like how a candidate gets elected. That seems really strange. And then also since, like, our whole election process system is set up uh, these like very two rigid party systems. Yeah. How does an independent or a third party candidate like even get to the ballot? Uh, the primary question first, uh, the nomination process question first. The Democrats are more standardized than the Republicans because the DNC, you know, the, 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 the DNC the Democrats, if you think about it, are more comfortable with centralized power. Uh, and Democrats and Republicans like to leave things in the states, mm -hmm. and so the DNC has controlled. Uh, even though we still have primaries and caucuses there, they, they, they control the rules more from above than the Republicans have. The Republicans uh, ha, are still willing, more, much more willing to let the state parties figure out how to comply uh, and how to do it. So state parties have, uh, you know, some of them are PR, some of them are going to take all. The, the Republicans will sometimes encourage you to do PR early. The early voting states will be PR, the later voting Sorry, states will be. So, what's PR? Proportional representation. Okay. So you get the number of, if you get 15%, you get a delegate. Okay. okay. You get rewarded for, in other words, you are not booted out because you got, you got 49% of the vote, you got no delegates. How fair is that? Not so fair. So the Republicans are a little more open about the rules. So what it means organizationally is you better know the rules of all 50 states. Plus, you know, Guam and Puerto Rico and places like that. You really got to know what those rules are going in. It's a really organizational profession. Now there was another question. Ah, oh, there's another third party. Yeah. So how does the third party candidate uh, get in with such like a rigid system? It's it's really hard um, uh, because the states run their own election systems, and so if you want to run as a third party candidate, you've got to figure out the ballot requirements for all 50 states. Some states are going to say you're on the ballot if you. Uh, uh, if you can get 10,000 signatures for your party candidate, you can be on the ballot. Other states will say, you've got to have some history of running candidates in the state. It's really, really very difficult to get all 50 state ballots because most of our election laws in America are left to the states. So they can have different requirements for what it takes to get a third party on the ballot. Really, really hard to do. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go over there first because she hasn't a chance to. Um, so back to the initial comment. Yeah. In the states that still decided not to see them. Um, or like the primaries, or Minnesota. Um, oh, Minnesota, sure. Yeah, it was um, a mess this year, too. It's always a mess. My, both my parents' pockets, and they were like, this. Was God, horrible. Horrible. Yeah. Um, but I've also, there was always this talk after the caucuses about votes not being very oh, yeah. clear or accurate. So how inaccurate are the caucuses? Was it really like, all right, it looks like it's about 50-50? Yeah. Or how does that work? Uh, poorly, a lot of times, if you're right, there are a lot of questions about it. Uh, because, you know, you're talking about volunteers. Right? You know, primary systems run by the state. Uh, and states are generally, <laughs> for a lot of them, pretty good about putting on fair elections. A caucus is, you know, you're about party volunteers. Um, some of whom will kind of, you know, their chairs have been known to bend the rules in favor of a certain candidate. Uh, sometimes even when that doesn't happen, uh, somebody like, I'll take Sanders, created an enormous amount of excitement, brought in people who had never been to a caucus before. You go to a caucus and you see things happening, you don't quite understand them, and you think, he's bending the rules against us, or she's bending the rules against us. And it's not really so, but it's a poorly understood uh, event. So. It, Kind of breeds distrust in some ways. And you know, the counts are not always actually. You know, you like, you got a crowded room and you're like, how many you got back there? <laughs> it, it can be a little, well, it's a little unprofessional at times. Most times people mean well, uh, party leaders try to, uh, you know, it's not the smoke filled back there. And anybody can get in, which is good. So people can blow the whistle. 
but we're still talking to kind of amateur events. Yeah, I know Minnesota after this last caucus has decided to switch to primaries. So. Yeah, well, yeah, that's one way to get away from that kind of thing. And the cries that it's undemocratic and, you know, leaves people out and stuff like that. It's pretty serious. You know, complaints these things, yeah. There's another question? Yes. Um, if someone wins a delegate, let's say like O'Malley had gotten a, de a delegate yeah. in Massachusetts, and then they drop out, what happened? Where does who the delegate is set free? Actually, in that, in that case, the delegate is free to vote as he or she wishes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of candidates sometimes will drop out and then and not release their delegates because they want to go to the convention with a few delegates and get involved, you know, get a seat on the rules committee or the platform or something. Anyway. Let me see here. Yeah. Cool. I'm sorry. I have another question. So super delegates, they're just kind of assigned by the party, right? Yes. And is Pretty there a sure. fixed yeah. number that they have to abide by? No, it depends on how many senators and representatives and governors you have. I mean, you know how many. Every You have a Democratic National Committee woman and a Democratic National Committee man from each state. Same thing on the Republican side. You know they're going to the convention, OK? Uh, and you know how many, if you happen to have an ex-president living in your state, you know he can go. Uh, not so many of them alive anymore, of course. Uh, and then it's, to, how many congressmen do we have in our party? How many senators do we have in our party? This is on the Democratic side. Republicans don't really have super delegates. They, all, more, I think all of their delegates basically go to the convention who are elected, other than you get your Republican National Committee woman, your Republican National Committee man, they represent you. Republicans here in Massachusetts at the Republican National Party and the state party chair, who's a terrific, funny woman in Kirsten Hughes, who also, this is why you should have her instead of me, Kirsten can do show tunes. She's an <laughs> awesome singer. She's mm -hmm. really good and fun. And boy, is she candid. Oh, she'll, oh, she'll tell you what it's about. She'll, I don't know, so she's good. Uh, but that's it. For, you know, they don't really have super so Let me talk a little about 2016. Uh, there's this wonderful book, Academics Use, about uh, who, who determines, uh, what really determines the outcome of the nomination process. It's called The Party Decides. Really influential book. Uh, and it's, the idea is that party members really do decide. And they just don't mean, it, it's probably a little unusual, unless you take a political party course or something. Uh, but the idea is that there's this thing called the invisible primary that occurs in the year or even two years before vote, real voting starts. And it occurs among intense policy demanders who ha are continually interested in the party, not just elected officials and party figures, but, you know, activists, environmental activists, abortion activists, uh, $15 a wage activists, all these kind of people on the Democratic side or evangelicals or Tea Parties on the Republican side. And they kind of, among themselves, assess the candidates who are running and determine who they think would be the best candidate. And the vote tends to follow that. And what these people are looking for is someone who's acceptable to them. So if I'm a pro-lifer, man, I want to make sure you, I've got a litmus test. You better be about you better be entirely pro-lifer, right? You know, you're not we're not going with you. Uh, and it has to be somebody who can win. Okay? And this has turned out to work in the post-reform era after the McGovern Frazier Commission. This has turned out to work pretty well. And it even worked before then. And it usually works unless the party is too weak to impose its will, which is where we all went wrong this year. Political scientists and journalists have said Trump never, uh, could never happen. Well, we were wrong. I was wrong. But there was a guy who was right. Oh, I'll give you an example. So, uh, the intense policy demanders are you know, regular figures in the party. And so the people at 538 Politics, really smart folks, uh, decided, well, we'll track the real insiders here and see the insiders favor. And sure enough, look at Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders. 523 total points of 13, and Sanders wins. Okay? Really, I mean, Clinton's been, Bernie Sanders joined the party a year ago. Clinton's been doing the work for decades, you know? But on the other hand, Donald Trump, who finished, I mean, he finished with 46 points. I mean, you can see uh, Rubio and Cruz finished with more points than him, and yet Trump gets the nomination. So it didn't work at all on that side. There's various theories about it, but I give you a, a theory by a political scientist named Norm Ornstein, who really predicted Trump ahead of time. Okay? I like Norm Ornstein. I don't know him personally. I like him because he's, got, he's a really good political scientist, 
and he's profane, and I like that. In that <laughs> so, he said, for decades now, the Republican Party has trivialized and delegitimized stuff and has run it down, saying say it doesn't work. Uh, we should get in there and throw everybody out. Uh, they've exploited nativism. Uh, they bought into these wild Rush Limbaugh, uh, uh, Hannity, Glenn Beck theories. Uh, they've attacked Obama. Uh, but they fail to deliver on promises uh, to their own rank and file in the Tea Party. That's Wilstein's idea. Really, Newt was, Newt might be the vice president on there. And so, Willem says of Newt, who recruited people and would give them the language to use, okay? We we're going to have you run for the uh, Congress in the, the 7th Congressional District in Ohio, and here's what you call Democrats call them corrupt, call them venal, call them baby killers. Use this language, it'll work. It did. Except, as Ornstein says, the problem is that all the people we recruited to come in really believed that shit. They believed that government was venal and corrupt and we should blow the whole thing up. Okay? So it's really, it's just, and this has led to a party that is really ripe for somebody like Trump. There's no one right there. So he said this in a recent interview. He says, so when you get a Donald Trump who is content, knows less about policy, domestic or international, I would say, than any candidate in the last 50 years, including Pat Paulson, the comedian, you have a large share of the public who say, you know, the people who know about policy were the ones who fucked all of this up. And so how could Trump be worse? <laughs> I like that theory. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> um, more seriously, I think it's, this is something that has really, the Republican Party is a real mess. When I, prior, uh, when I was back to the party the sides and I said, well, you know, this theory works unless the party is weak. The Republicans are really weak. Uh, you might remember a little over, well, about a year ago, not quite a year ago, they, 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 the caucus, Republican House caucus, essentially kicked out the speaker. Uh, uh, Boehner just said, I am done dealing with you. And then the next in line uh, was the House Majority Leader and the Freedom Caucus, which the Tea Party wouldn't get behind him, so he was out. And they basically went to Paul Ryan and they, take the job, and Ryan didn't really want to do it. I mean, this is the second most powerful electoral position in American politics. You usually don't have to beg politicians to take it. And it's a sign of real dysfunction in the Republican Party. And, and this is what's led, I mean, in some ways. I agree with you, what's the, it's led to the Trump, okay? Uh, I would bore and ask me if, uh, if this process will change. Well, it's changed all the time. Uh, in the modern era, it's changed after all these years. I think one reform, I don't know if this is what the Rules Committee will do with the Democratic Party, but a lot of people, I think the Sanders people, and they have a lot of delegates, are going to move to get rid of super delegates. I don't know if that will happen or not, but it's one thing that might change. The Republicans will probably uh, come out of this and say, we've got to change our process. I mean, look what happened. 2016, we got Trump. In 2012, the uh, Republicans commissioned the Growth and Opportunity Project, which is a report on what they needed to do to win the presidential election in 2016. Uh, and part of that dealt with having fewer debates because the party leaders said, we had all these debates and all people did was attack Mitt Romney and Mitt Romney looked bad the whole time. And why are we throwing mud at our own guy? So let's have fewer debates. Didn't really quite pan out. Uh, one substantive recommendation was Look how badly we did among Hispanics. We got to be nice to Hispanics. Mm -hmm. Well, they haven't exactly panned out on that front either. So, you know, <laughs> there are things you can try and do over the years. It will continue to evolve. It always evolves. Like Thomas Jefferson said, I don't want to. If I have to go to, I don't, I don't want to go to heaven if I have to go to the party. Well, here we are, uh, <laughs> and we'll still have parties for the foreseeable future. Okay. Uh, let me see what else. Something I think the electoral college something we address, right? This is all, this is another thing from the. It's a constitutional. It's from the founders, okay? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a little elitist, you know, the Constitution, we're not really a democratic form of government, we're, we're a republic. And the Constitution initially said, well, we'll directly elect mem the members of the House, okay? That'll be the direct election, people directly elect them. But the Senate, eh, we don't want people electing the Senate. Well, the state legislatures come out of the Senate, okay? Direct election of senators came along later, amendment to the Constitution. But the president, how are we going to choose the president? People, not such a good idea. Uh, Congress, maybe. No, that he's too beholden to Congress. So they came up with this idea of the Electoral College, 
which would be each state would get a number of electors that would equal the number of congressmen plus the two senators. So Massachusetts has nine congressmen, two senators, 11 electors. And the states can figure out how they, most of the states since they will have a direct election or electors. But what is supposed to happen is the electors are supposed to meet at the exact same time in December and determine who they will cast their votes for. And all at the same time so there can be no collusion between the states. Remember, there's no internet in, in 1787, okay? So you can't collude. And the idea also was that electors would kind of be leading members of the community and they would be able to tell the frauds and the charlatans and the demagogues and weed them out and produce what, this is my favorite phrase in the book, I love about this, we would produce continental characters, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Madison in Federalist 51 says, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. Boy, was he right. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were figuring, you know, one day, you know, this system has to be constructed so an idiot can run it, because one day an idiot will. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and they, and they came out of the convention and said, listen, the first guy is going to be Washington. We all know that. Thank God it's Washington. We all trust him. After that, we don't know what could happen. But, you know, the Electoral College is supposed to produce electric continental characters. It never really worked right. Uh, uh, but today, we still have it. Uh, uh, here's the you know, kind of familiar map of the 2012 results. You have to get to 270 uh, Electoral College votes. There are 538 nationally. Uh, here's the breakdown from, uh, you know, 2012. So, uh, and it also, you know, it also determines where candidates are going to spend their time and where, and we're kind of lucky in some ways. We're not going to see a lot of TV ads here for the presidential candidates. Because in Massachusetts, the Democrats are going to win no matter what, okay? Uh, uh, and in Texas, uh, should I take Texas this time? Yeah, Texas, the Republicans are going to win no matter what. But look at those shaded states, Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, those are swing states. Could go either way, so all the money will be spent there. But, so that's sort of the electoral college. It's never really worked out the way it should. And I got one more slide, but I'm going to take the question first, because this slide's kind of fun. Uh, I have a question. It's my last one, too. Uh, <laughs> I have a question about the electoral college. Sure. So I don't know if it was 2008 or 2012, but Trump won the election. Yeah. And then Nebraska got like one because of how it was split up, the, uh, the vote, the Electoral College, Omaha went, yeah, yeah. Obama, the rest went to yeah. whoever was running against them. Electoral College votes are winner take all in the state. So if you win Massachusetts, you get all 11. If you win Massachusetts by one vote, you get all 11. And that is the case in 48 states, except for Nebraska and Maine. In Nebraska and Maine, they do it a little differently. I know this about Maine, I'm not sure it's exactly the way Nebraska works. They do it by split down the middle. No, you get the you, 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 and they're small. They tend you get the delegate, you get the elector from that congressional district if you win the congressional district. So Maine has two congressional districts. Uh, the first and the second. Uh, let's say the Democrat wins the first and the Republican wins the second. They each get one electoral college vote. And let's say the Republican wins the state of Maine, that Republican then gets two additional electoral college votes, so it's three to one. And I think this is the most, sort of the way Nebraska yeah. yeah. So they're the only two states that do it. It's winner take all of wow. the You know, they can control their own electors. States can. But, you know, I'm not quite sure why we have this one reform that has been proposed to get around this crazy electoral college system. Uh, others have said that elect, you know, we should require electors uh, uh, to vote proportionally, to have a vote proportionally based on the state. And then even in a state like Massachusetts, a Republican would get electors, because you're going to get 40% of the vote. So maybe you should get 40% of the electors. It sounds more democratic, but not the way we do it. It's never been a way we do it. Is there a reason why? Like, why? You know, I don't know enough about the electoral college to say that. Um, you know, I suspect it has to do with, you know, the parties are pretty rigid on protecting their own position. Uh, and so forth. So I, I guess it has to do that. But I don't know enough about the, what the, the proposed, the history of the proposed electoral college reforms to be sure about that. So like, I, I heard part of the reason they have it that way is they want to um, give people who live in less um, populated areas a voice as well. So yeah. if it were 
population base, it would just be like the people of the city to basically choose our president. That can be bad. That sounds plausible. Sure. That yeah. okay. No, that's, that's very plausible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, rural areas in this country have, just by virtue of the fact that we have a U.S. Senate constructed the way we do, every state gets two senators. Uh, rural interests are, are advantaged in some ways because if you're a state in Montana, I think has one, one congressman, they might have 700,000 citizens, but they get two senators. You know, so, and that had, tends to advantage, be an advantage of rural states. And thus, three electoral colleges, even though they get 700,000 people. Yeah. Who happens? Okay. This is the last slide. Honest. Uh, our whole form of governor, Bill Weldon, uh, is the uh, vice presidential candidate for the libertarian ticket uh, with former New Mexico governor uh, Gary Johnson. Uh, I don't know how much you follow this, but the interesting thing to me about this that has to do with the electoral college is one premise I have heard about this is that Johnson and Weld want to pick up some electoral college votes. They won't, but they want, but they want to advance the libertarian idea too. Uh, but they want to pick up some electoral college votes to throw the election into the House of Representatives. This is another bizarre constitutional artifact. But if no one gets 270 electoral college votes, right, the electors report to Congress. They all send in their electoral totals to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives meets them. They open it and they say, oh, my god, nobody gets 270. What now? Somebody reads the Constitution and says, what now? We get to pick. The House picks who the president will be. Cool, man. But we got to pick from the top three finishes. So the top three finishes will be Trump, Clinton, and Gary Johnson. And i got to tell you, I'm not so sure I want the House of Representatives making that pick. Because it's going to be Republican. Uh, by the way, if you're a Republican, you might be happy about that. Uh, which is fine, but I just think, and can you imagine, like, 16 years after essentially the Supreme Court decides uh, that, that Bush becomes the president, that we have the House of Representatives to sign on? <laughs> oh, I don't want to go there, it'll be a mess. So this idea is a terrible idea, but not the only one in American politics, I must say. New Hampshire's failure of libertarian, we might take a shot there. I don't know a lot about New Mexico. I mean, Gary Johnson, I think, won two terms in, in New Mexico, failed to block the God. A couple of Western states might be more libertarian. So they have to be very targeted. Third party, somebody mentioned earlier, and if you're at 15% in the national polls, there's a commission, a, a national commission, that runs the presidential debates. And their rule is that if a third party is getting 15%, then their candidate gets in the debate. So what these two want to do is get 15% in national polls, and then they'll be allowed into the national debates, which obviously gives them two jobs. That's one process. So my last slide. Uh, so I'd like to take any other questions if they happen to be in. Yes? Uh, there hasn't been any mention of super PACs. Um, how has ah. how has that affected the delegate process? Or you know, I, I, don't know. I spend my waking moments working on dark money lately. I've been dragging the rabbit hole of this dark money thing that I can't develop. Um, super PACs are uh, have only been around for a few years since a 2010 decision called Citizens United that basically just opened up uh, the ability of PACs to take unlimited amounts of money from. Unions from corporations or from wealthy people. Uh, it's, it's a truly extraordinary amount of money. Uh, and super PACs is only one part of it. Probably not even the most troubling part of the whole campaign finance system today. Uh, but they're enormously influential. Uh, super PACs now, uh, on the national level, the presidential campaign, have spent more on behalf of candidates than the candidates themselves. Super PACs have to be independent of the candidate, of the campaign itself. And you know, I don't like to use that thing because it's silly. Uh, but uh, they kind of, you know, so you remain independent. I mean, and they exist over here in, in Massachusetts last week, the photo race, super PACs backing or opposing Baker and Coker, spent more than Baker and Coker did himself. It's an enormous amount of money. It's not subject to campaign limitations. So if I were an enormously wealthy person and I just said, you know what, I'm really. I'm going to spend whatever it takes to elect uh, Donald Trump. Okay. Sheldon Adelson, huge giver, 
uh, casino multi-billionaire, grew up in Dorchester, by the way. Uh, his big thing in life is Israel, and his own, he clicks the Republican Party, is one for Israel. He said he was, he'll spend a hundred million of his own money this year. Chunk change for him. Kind of serious money for me. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, I feel like um, in the in like the in the political arena, we generally paint Democrats as like pro campaign finance reform, reform and yeah. Republicans as like anti yeah. campaign finance reform, specifically around Citizens yeah. United. Yeah. Um, has there been polling around what like just average citizens think? about the content of it, like yeah. outside of the rhetoric? Average citizens want this Citizens United thing that way. They would, they, they would like it to be repealed. They would like to have a system in which big money does not dominate politics. But po what politicians understand is people care about that, but not so much that they make a decision based on it. You know, uh, there isn't really a huge citizens movement uh, and uprising. But there clearly are citizens who are very Concerned about it and uh, are moving to change it, uh, but you know, I, I, broadly you're right. Republicans really like it because they benefit more from corporate money and so forth. Uh, a lot of Democrats are pretty happy with money, uh, and a lot of Democrats, uh, you know, operate quite freely. You know, this is Sanders' attack on his attacks on Clinton. They're too close to Wall Street. Yeah, so you know, but Democrats have been too close to Wall Street for a long time. Now. You know, look at. It. 1936, right? The Democratic nominee is campaigning in Madison Square Garden, and he stands up and, and he says to the people in Madison Square Garden, huge crowd sharing him, and says, Wall Street hates me, and I treasure their hatred. <laughs> right? 80 years later, you got somebody down at Goldman Sachs saying, that'll be 225 a pop for this speech before I go on. That's a huge difference, man. I mean, that's a huge difference. It really is. It's very discouraging, I think. And it has, you know, if you wonder about the kind of politics we have in this country now, my little story, I think, will tell you something about it. It's discouraging. Yes. So if you think that uh, the way politics are right now is discouraging, um, what do you think the best way to enact, like, reform and change in our political process is? There's some really good folks working on this that have some terrific ideas. Long term, on, 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 well, with the hope that the Supreme Court someday would, would, would reverse itself on Citizens United. Longer term a constitutional amendment, these things are very difficult to do. But even short of that, there are things that can be done at a lot of levels to increase disclosure of who's actually giving this money. A lot of this money, when we, I say dark money, I mean money that we we can't tell where it's The citizen cannot tell where it's coming from. Literally cannot tell where it's coming from. Uh, super PACs can take money from a number of entities and what super PACs, a lot of super PACs can, can take money, well, they can all take money, but they attract money from organizations that are called Internal Revenue Code 501C4 organizations, which can accept unlimited donations, can keep their donors uh, anonymous, and then the 501C4 can contribute to a super PAC, which can then spend the money. We will never know. We'll know it's, you know, the Mo Cunningham, you know, social welfare organization. That's social welfare is the 501c4 term. The Mo Cunningham social welfare. Well, you know, I wouldn't use my own name. I'd say, I'd say, you know, Americans for a for a bountiful harvest. It's always something like that. Well, <laughs> so, so the super PAC would receive, you know, eight million dollars from Americans for a bountiful harvest, uh, 501c4 organization, and then you say, aha! We'll never find out who the hell gave, gave the $8 million dollars that's a, to the 501c4. It's anonymous. Well, no. It's a real, it's terrible. Yes. Do you think if we were able to um, ship the system to have like a viable third party, do you think that that would, maybe less on like a, a campaign finance reform, but just in general, like do you think that there's a possibility that we'll ever be on a three or more party system where the third party candidates are viable? And like, do you think that would improve things? How do you make that even happen? Because I find the two-party system to be a little problematic. It leads yeah. to a, a situation where a lot of people feel like they have to choose the lesser of two evils and the independent candidate is, is not viable, you know? Well, the, the big problem with it is systemically, 
constitutionally and institutionally, we are set up for two parties. I mean, the big office that drives it, a lot of all the fit politics is the presidency. And the presidency is, you know, it's a winner take all. It's not a winner take all. We don't have winner take all politics. We have a plurality. So you could have the last strong third party candidate was Ross Perot. 92, he get something like 90% of the vote, but he got no. Did he win? Did he get one of the main delegates? Maybe he did. Uh, the main electorates. I'm not sure. If he did, he got one of them. 90%, he got nothing, right? So you look at that and say, Am I, do I want to waste my vote on somebody who's not going to get it? There, you know? Uh, and this holds true throughout. We have single member districts for the most part, and congressmen are from single member districts, and we have plurality voting. So even if you have a strong third party candidate, the advantage, you know, a third party candidate might get 30%, right? That would be a great show by a third party candidate. Uh, but if somebody else gets 40%, then that person, or 45%, that person is going to Congress. So the system is structured in a way that discourages third party candidates. And the Democrats and the Republicans, who after all run Congress and every legislature in the nation, don't want the competition. So they structure their own state party laws to discourage third party candidates. It's really tough. I'll say here in Massachusetts, there is a third party trying to get ballot position. It's called the United Independent Party. Not an endorsement or anything of them, but the guy who's working very hard, the guy named Evan Falchuk is working very hard. He needs people to enroll in his party so he can get ballot position in other years. But that's the only thing going on in the state. Yes. I mean, so I guess. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you. Yeah. Just because I want to make sure that there, there are people who haven't asked the question yet, and they have a chance to do that. Oh, sure. Okay, yeah. pause. You're, you're awesome. You're keeping pause. it all going. So let's just mm -hmm. pause for a second. Is there anyone who hasn't asked the question yet who has something that they want to throw out there? Did you get a chance? What can we learn from other countries? You know, I'm not a comparatist. I, I'm, I'm entirely American. Uh, yeah. okay, is, <laughs> is, is there the countries that have a similar election process as us? Or are we like the one, you know, we, what's your unique? We're not going to go to what, I mean, we have, I know, a little bit about other countries. We're not going to do what they do. But, you know, parliamentary systems are much more responsive uh, than our system is. Uh, you know, Britain's a little bit of a peculiar one, because uh, you really only have two major parties there, a third party that but there are, there are uh, uh, parliamentary systems where there are multiple parties. You know, Germany has multiple parties. Uh, a lot of European countries have multiple parties. And uh, there's proportional representation voting. So these multiple parties uh, get seats in the legislature. Uh, and, you know, when you think about it, it's more representative. Really. It's more democratic with a small d. If, people's, if people can find that you know, if I'm a socialist Democrat, um, where I don't have a lot, have a lot of chance of electing too many people here in America, but in a lot of European countries, social Democrats will pick up 15, 20, 25 percent of the vote, and they'll get 15, 20, 25 percent of the members of Parliament, and they will then be available to go into a coalition government with other parties to get over 50 percent. So, if that can be and also in parliamentary systems, we, they don't separately elect the president. They have a prime minister who is the leader of the party. So, you know, over, over in Great Britain, Cameron just resigned and gave his resignation to Queen, and the conservatives have decided, uh, because they have most uh, votes in, in the British parliament, they've decided on a new party leader, and that party leader becomes the prime minister. Uh, and thus, you have the party behind you. You know, one, problem, one of the problems Obama had in, 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 in passing health care was he had members of his own party in the Senate who didn't want to pass health care. You know? Whereas in a parliamentary system, you're the leader of the party. You're elected with them. Uh, and so you have their loyalty. So it can be a more effective party system. So yeah, there are other systems, but we're not changing any of that. There are, there are really good other systems. Yes? Do you have any prediction on who the vice president <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, what I always say about predictions is, is, is there's been great scholarly work done on how inaccurate expert predictions are. <laughs> and, and, and embarrassingly enough, the work was done on political scientists. So I don't feel I should make any. But I'm sort of, I'm sort of secretly hoping for Newt because he's so bombastic. The two of them together would be great. And then on the other side, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I still kind of, you know, 
I'll give, away, I'll give away my, my political meanings if I haven't already. I kind of would like to see Elizabeth Warren get it. Hmm. Uh, I don't think she will. Probably Tim Kaine of Virginia. Well, I, I don't I think he's got it. And... But, but, but Virginia is a... Uh, Kaine has been a, twice the governor of Virginia and has been elected to the Senate twice there. And Virginia is one of those swing states. So, listen, people, everybody, everybody running for president says, I'm picking the best person. If anything should happen to me, I know that Sarah Palin here will stand right and step right in and be a magnificent president if anything should happen to me. Baloney. Everybody picks somebody they think will help them get elected. Right? That's it. That's a, that is the criteria. Only thing you need to know. Is that person going to help me get elected? Because I'm planning on it. And will it be announced in the next two weeks? Yeah, usually you'll, yeah. Trump is going to announce on Friday, apparently. Uh, geez, I'm trying to think of when was the last time somebody might have gone to the convention before announcing. They usually announce it. You know, it gives you more press, you know. It's a press, you know. They, they, campaigns are wondering every day, are we going to win the press? Are we going to win the day in the press? Well, you name your Mike VP nominee, and you win the day in the press. So, yeah, I was going to say, um, the NPR politics uh, did a profile on both the Democrat and Republican potential candidates. So there's like the these are the nine yeah. candidates that are being vetted by each campaign. So they have a little profile of each of the nine, you know, from both sides. So you can start to see you know, yeah. which ones have actually been talking to each. Yeah. I just yeah. know a very a predominant person in Boston just stepped out from the predominant seat for something. Oh yeah. yeah. Also the CEO of the startup Really the CEO of what? Startup Institute. Not sure where she's no going. Kidding. All we all we've heard is that it's something very it's probably not dear to her heart. That no no no, not that she would be, be like VP, yeah. but like running potentially a campaign. I don't know. Oh really? We're all speculating. We have no idea. Yeah, I'm all Yeah. But yeah, probably the nine people that you mentioned there. Yeah, there's there's like these these are people who are yeah. in, in in talks and being vetted currently. Yeah. Who else? Is it asking this one? Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> what do you think it happens when, like, the people, uh, there's so much absenteeism during elections. So how do, we, how do people can, like, really get motivated to vote when there is not enough, like, education? Like, a lot of people don't even know how to access the, uh, like, how to vote. And also, the fact that election happens during the work day, yeah. and a lot of people don't even have access because of work. Yeah. And there is the, like, and that has never become as an issue that needs to be addressed. Voter access is a huge issue. Uh, we don't do a great job on it in this country. Uh, voter access is up to each state. You know, each state determines uh, the hours that the polls are going to be open, oftentimes where the polls are going to be. Uh, I think Oregon and maybe one other state don't even have polls anymore. You do it all by mail. There have been proposals to do it online. Uh, a lot of states have, they have their election day, but you can go in any time in the two weeks prior, or you can just request a ballot, I'll send it to you, and you vote by mail. There are a lot of things we can do. The biggest problem we have with ballot access in, the, in this country right now, folks, is uh, the Supreme Court a few years ago made a decision uh, that essentially gutted uh, a piece of legislation called the Voting Rights Act, originally passed in 1965, amended many times since. By virtue of doing that, a number of states Coincidentally, most of them were Republicans, Republican legislatures, and most of them were in states that Obama won in 2008, uh, have imposed new uh, voter ID laws. And these voter ID laws is intended, and I believe, because a good friend of mine and colleague wrote an important paper on it, uh, are, are, are meant to, uh, to limit uh, ballot access uh, to minority votes. And it's a, it's a huge scandal in this country. I think there are about 28 states now that have done these kind of things. It's shocking. Uh, the claim is that, they're, it, it, that these states are trying to prevent voter fraud. There is. You know, let me tell you, people aren't pouring across the Mexican border and going down the polls to vote so you, you know, they can be found out and thrown out of the country. It's absurd. It's, you know, it's a lot of baloney, but it's the worst thing going on right now. It's the biggest problem we have in a sea of other problems with voter access. Uh, and, you know, states run their own election system. So Florida has a different system than we do. Even in Florida in 2000, one county was running on paper ballots, another was running on a computerized system, which really is not uniformity. We've always done that, not had uniformity. We've got lots of states. I hope that helps. Is that up?
Yeah. So what do you think it will be a, a solution like to get community engaged in, in voting, especially minorities who yeah. don't think they have access to it? You know, I I don't study race and politics. I think this is a hell of an interesting thing, though. You know, you had much more turnout with Obama, obviously, at the head of the ticket. And, you know, it's likely that that will fall off some for both African Americans and uh, young people, two areas he did very well. But on the other hand, you know, I, this is, I mean, you've got, you've got a lot of reasons, those who attempt to mobilize uh, disadvantaged communities uh, have a lot of reasons to really be fired up this year because of the things that Trump has said about immigrant populations and so forth. And a lot of anger in the African American. You know, what's going on right now with you know Black Lives Matter and so forth? I don't know how it's going to play out, but it it, 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 it it is an opportunity for people. People have to be fired up. And, you know, we don't go to the polls, but fifty percent turnout is a big deal. Here. So, and and oftentimes minority communities as well. So, I'm really interested to see the answer to that question this year myself. I'm not sure. I don't know. I have I have answer. Yes. I was just going to say, if you are interested in getting uh, people motivated to vote, you can kind of always like volunteer for an election campaign and go to door to door to different communities and make sure people know where their polling places and that kind of thing. <coughs> and it's just like a small one person way, but if you're a lot of people doing that, the more people who know where the polling places and whatever. You know, and I'll tell you something nerdy political science studies. Turn up something interesting every now and then. That is really the most effective thing that uh, candidates and, and interests, if you have an interest you, that you, that you feel is important, that, that uh, may be organized for the campaign, and parties and candidates and interests, uh, going door to door and talking to neighbors is the most effective political technique there is. You know? These people will spend umpteens of millions of dollars, you know, matching each other on TV, and it will all wash out. Uh, but what's really important is hearing from your neighbors. So yeah, do that. Get, get involved if you can. Too. Plus, it's cool. It's a lot of fun. Campaign is fun. Yes. Um, so I don't know about anybody else here. I'm still in denial that Donald Trump is serious about <laughs> the presidency. Um, I kind of think his whole campaign is a giant exit strategy of like, how much bullshit is this country going to eat yeah. out of my mouth here? So. Um, I did find one article that was written that was talking about him not taking it seriously and yeah. you know, possibly stepping down. If he were to win the election and prior to inauguration he did step down, what type of process would happen or follow or is, I mean? I don't honestly know. I mean, after inauguration day he's the vice president, obviously, but I'm, I'm not sure what the answer to that question. I would imagine it would be the vice president. That's honestly, what I was thinking too, I mean, but I don't know. So I mean, you know, so. I mean, yeah. 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 It, it's been a discouraging year, I have to say, in a lot of ways. I, I really have not liked a lot of things I've seen this year. People like to talk about it, and I say, well, I have to follow it as a professional obligation, but really, I'd like to like wake up in like, mid November. It's <laughs> over. So it's, it's just, it's been a very hard, it's been a very difficult year politically. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, you know, you learn, about, you learn a lot of things about the country that you'd rather not have to think about. I mean, to be better this year, in my opinion, and uh, it's been, I'm an optimistic person about the country, but there, there have been a lot of discoveries this year. Uh, oh, yes, again, yeah, yeah. and then we'll, uh, actually, do you have your chance here? Uh, uh, I haven't. No. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so looking back at that electoral map, I mean, in the end, it seems like really there are like seven states that yeah. matter, yeah. Um, which is, I guess, a little discouraging in a state that kind of doesn't matter because we know which yeah. way we're going. Um, but do you see that setup just changing because it, it feels uh, kind of discouraging and disengaging for a lot of the country just to kind of like, you know, rubber stamp your vote in a blue or red state and then, you know, hope, hope North Carolina goes our way, you know? You really have to change the way we deal with the Electoral College and there have often been reforms proposed about that. I mean, the big year for, that spurred a lot of discussion about doing something different about the Electoral College was 2000 when the Supreme Court ultimately made the decision that led to um, George Bush winning the Electoral College. But even after that, it just died out. I mean, it's, it's just a really hard thing. It's a very hard system to change. Mm -hmm. And it kind of dies out, so I'm not quite sure I see it happening. Yeah. Okay. I, I was just going to, um, one of the things, that, so there's a quote, uh, if voting changed anything, they would have made it illegal. 
<laughs> um, which uh, is actually like attributed to an anarchist. But um, in terms of uh, kind of tying into all of a lot of this thread is that uh, you know voting in a city council election has a much much greater impact, and your vote absolutely matters in a local election um, where the voter turnout is even lower than at the national level. Yeah. And there's not this like intermediary like proportional represent all of this other stuff that happens, and um, and local elections are actually the things that like those decisions impact your life every day. Like those are the people yeah. that are determining you know what parking structures we have and what the T is doing, and so um, so I, I don't know. I'm just maybe just a plug to like if, like if you are interested in getting involved and feeling discouraged by the stuff at the national level to to not completely disengage and, and maybe try to plug in at the local level too. Yeah. And just a quick yeah. point on that, I mean, the uh, leaders at the national level have started somewhere, right? Not, not everybody right. was born into yeah. a, you know, a legacy of sorts, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, we, you're absolutely right, you're entirely right, and you can see these people just about any time you want to. You know, they're down in the coffee shop, they're having a beer after work, Grab them and talk to them. You call them and say, I want to come by and talk to them. They hear from three people. It's a groundswell, and they say, Oh, my God, I need to talk about this issue. One of yeah. the Cambridge City Council members works out of Fort Clark or has an office here, right? Leland? Is yeah. he still here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and he loves hearing from constituents. Yeah. yeah. Not to mention, I see the dean. And the dean, although, the street, yeah. Even all over the place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they yeah, they're great. It's often, yeah, it's really fun to get engaged with them and talk to them. You find out, I mean, I. And I have a lot of you know, students who do internships at the state house and stuff. And I say, go over there and we'll find out these are really good people. You know, most of them are there for the, you know, they have the right, you know, whichever side they're on, they're there because they believe that they're trying to represent their constituents pretty well. There are some who are less great than others. There are some who don't work very, very hard and some who work constantly. But you'll find out most of them are they hot in the right place. It's a good experience for anybody. Really. Okay, yeah. I'm still trying to get past. What is, you know, the RNC, the Democratic National Convention, what do they have to do with, you know, the Electoral College and, you know, because you keep saying that, you know, the states make the rules about yeah. how X amount of people get to go and where the voting booths are. And then, you know, I heard you mention counties make some decisions. Yeah. Oh, and so, <laughs> but what, what, what about the RNC and the DNC? Don't they make rules too? That, and they're like private they do have relations. Yeah. They, you know, they kind of set the rules for how the convention is going to be structured, what the rules are. But then, you know, the highest body of the party is the convention itself. So uh, the convention will vote on the rules and so forth. So the method will vote. A whole lot of work will come out of the rules, rules committees and so forth. It's an enormously complicated process. If you think about the Iowa caucuses, the Iowa caucuses that are held on a really cold winter night in January <laughs> don't really elect the delegates to go to Cleveland. What the Iowa caucuses do, which are held in towns and wards, which are small, smaller parts of cities. So here in Cambridge, we have 11 wards. Uh, and you have a, a, a caucus in each ward and in each town for each party. So what you're really doing in, caucus, in, in Iowa is you're meeting in your town caucus to elect delegates to go to the county convention, which is down the road. And at the county convention, those delegates elect delegates to go to the state convention. And those delegates at the state convention will vote for the delegates to go to the national convention. Simple process, huh? Out of all this, we decide on the cold night in January who won the losses. But it's, you know, that's the way it works in Iowa and in a lot of other states, is you're, 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 you're constantly bumping up. It's a really convoluted process. And you see the people that run the Iowa caucus are who? The states? Party members. Party members of what? Republican and Democratic parties. Okay, the Republican and Democratic parties, they're just private organizations. They have nothing yeah. to do. So they they set their own rules. Uh, yep. Right. But then the states and you know the country sets its own rules with you know what in regard to you know, the, the way that I don't understand. So we all get a vote, right? We all. Yep. That's the what was that one called? We all get one vote. One person, one vote. An important constitutional decision. Yeah. And there's the other where you know it's, what was the other one? It's the electoral. The electoral college. Yeah. yeah. I thought there was like two. We get a vote, and then there's 
Yeah. People that we voted in get to vote for us. And well, don't, maybe, don't forget, if you're an independent voter in Iowa, you don't get to vote at all. <laughs> because parties are membership organizations, and parties can decide we're going to let certain people in and not let some other people. Like, you can go down and say, I think it's Iowa, you can show up and say, uh, hand me my registration papers. I want to, I'm registering as a, as a Republican right here, right now. And you can commit. But other states won't do to say, if you're not on our voter list that was set a month ago, we're not letting you in the vote. So, New York. that also puts up another barrier for voter for yeah. voter turnout. No. Yeah. And Minnesota also the same day registration. Yeah, yeah exactly. The same day registration, very important to increase the turnout. Uh, but the electoral college system, so the parties kind of run their nomination system. The electoral college system is constitutionally based. And we get to pick from whoever they nominate. Well, they wind up nominating, finally, next week, the Republicans will nominate one person, it will be Trump. Next week, the Democrats will nominate one person, it will be Clinton. And we get to pick, out of all this, starting off in Iowa in January, we'll pick between those two. <laughs> you could join a party, you could choose to join one of the parties. Yeah, and right? be active in the and party. And be active in that party, and then you're helping to set the... Right, but you said by design, third parties aren't going to be able to... Constitutionally, and the way our institutions are show up, it's very hard to do. It. You know, you have a winner-take-all uh, 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 districts, and only one person gets elected and can be elected with a plurality. And whoever gets the most votes is going to do it. That's very high for three. So, if you come to a conclusion that you want to make radical change, you have to change the parties within, rather than going outside and starting the third one. It's not a system that's really wide open to radical change. So or more, more, more change than that. Yeah. You, you kind of have to. <laughs> these are the best avenues, as flawed as they are to do that. Okay. There's more. There's there's broader range of political party at the local level. Like at the city level, there's more than just Democrats and Republicans black and white. At the city level, and, and a lot in a lot of places, the elections are nonpartisan. So here in Cambridge, or I think most every municipality in Massachusetts, you don't run as a Democrat or Republican. Or Libertarian or Green Party, you just run as you, you know, and, and so they're completely nonpartisan. Yes. Okay, so you have parties, right? Yeah. All sort of parties, and is that a, a legal definition or party? Like, is, it, is the Democratic Party also a, a party and then also is a nonprofit that supports the party that has like staff and and money and. So, yeah, in, American, in American law, parties are legally recognized. Okay. Uh, so there's a, there's a, like a business designation? A yes. Designation as a you could go to the headquarters, exactly. Mm -hmm. You could go to like a headquarters? Like, sure, yeah. yeah. This headquarters is, I think, Democrat. I don't know where the, Demo I don't know where the party headquarters are anymore. Well, the Democrats are downtown. I know that. And I think the Republicans are over Quincy. Mm -hmm. But the Massachusetts, so the Massachusetts Democratic Party is downtown, and there's a Republican uh, it used to be downtown, it's not there anymore, I think. Massachusetts Republican Party. And this exists in all 50 states. And then down in Washington, there's a Democratic National Committee, and they probably own a building. And the Republican National Committee, they probably own another building. Yeah. So, sorry to follow on that. So, does the party have staff? Oh, yeah, sure. And the staff then is mainly working on the convention and then designating the rules and. They work on, yeah, uh, uh, you know, these, these parties raise millions and millions and millions and millions, tens of thousands of millions of dollars. So they have staff that work on the convention, they have staff that works on anything you can name political, opposition research on the other side, recruiting candidates to run in the next election, uh, um, technology, yeah. social media. They're working on a wide range of things, you know? Yeah, yeah. Big staffs, professional staffs, yes. How is a platform developed? Like for a, does a, once a candidate is nominated, is there, there's a platform that is developed after that nomination, or is there like a party platform that? They, there's a party platform that's voted on at each convention. That kind of serves as a template. But then, uh, I mean, you know, I'm not quite sure how it happens, but I'll, I'll wing it a little bit on this one. Um, Platform committees are, are named from among the delegates and from among the party leaders. And they work on a proposed platform. So the Democrats are working on that platform right now. The Republicans are nearly finished. Uh, 
Uh, and those platform proposals, and there are amendments to those, and people offering, I want to cut out this line and add this line, and you have votes on it. And those will be placed before the conventions in the next two weeks. And at that time, delegates can move to amend the, platform, the, the, the proposed platform as well. And that may happen. Uh, so, yeah, but they're, they're in the process for a longer period. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how each uh, party structures their platform committee. But they're in, they're in process for a while before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the Trump people, I mean, actually, Trump has pretty much stayed out of the platform process. Uh, which is really unusual. He doesn't really care what they say anyway, you know. So, uh, uh, but, you know, the more conservative elements, particularly the social conservatives, have been prevailing there. And so it's going to be a fairly conservative platform. Trump will ignore it. Uh, uh, and on the Democratic side, Sanders is winning a few things and not winning other things. Uh, but he'll have some stamp on the platform as well. So he's got, he's got a, you want a lot of delegates. You put delegates comes with a power. They can't afford to say, eh, you didn't get a clear majority go away. Yeah. The draft, the, the draft Democratic platform is up. You can download it currently. Yes. Like, it's a really long document. Oh, all over it. Everybody it's wants to get into it. Uh, cool. Yeah, everybody wants to get into it. And, and both parties should have their drafts up. I know both have their Republican one. I couldn't find it. There's still the 2012 one. You can, you can look at the 2012 Republican online. It's, it's being amended at much more conservative than the 2012 one. And social issues, I understand. You know, the biggest health crisis facing the nation is pornography. Uh, you know, a lot of things that might not occur. You know, they're still fighting the battle of the same-sex marriage. They lost that one. They're fighting it still. So it's going to be an interesting platform. But, you know, Bob Dole in 1996 said, "Well, I didn't even read the damn thing." Oh, you know, keep it easy, Nora. Yeah. Yes. Um, what? What does the Libertarian National Convention look like? They already had it. Something, something, had, something happened this year with voting? They had it. I can't remember where they had it, but they had it. Las Vegas? Was it no. Vegas? I thought it was Vegas. One of the, I mean, you can just, it's so easy to find out. It's the glories of uh, technology, but you can use it. There was, I mean, they don't, you know, Libertarians, they don't believe in a lot of rules. So some, some guy got up, and he, he wasn't like one of these slim fit types. He was a sort of a, big guy, and so he got up being a libertarian, and he just decided we weren't going to have any rules, so he did a strip show. Right? He's like, taking the clothes off and throwing them around on the stage and everything. That's sort of a precursor to Johnson as well. I mean, it's pretty good to find it on YouTube. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Big heavy guy, beard, you know, throwing his clothes here and there. It's great. Uh, libertarians sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> There was like a, there was like a, I wouldn't understand how it works. So, Democratic National Convention has different rules than the Republicans. Yeah, yeah. So do the Libertarians, or does, are they more aligned with somebody else? And I heard there was like a voting thing where they did like Gary Johnson, uh, or maybe it was Bill Well, they they didn't get enough of the vote, and so yeah. they had to have like a revote, and until like they got enough. That could have happened. I didn't follow it very carefully. A lot of Libertarians don't think Well is a true Libertarian. Uh, you know, they, they think he's taken, you know, he's, he's well, been a Republican, he's been a Republican, he's endorsed Democrats, he endorsed Obama. Um, he hasn't, you know, he's been like kind of a law and order type when he was governor and not so libertarian on issues that libertarians think are true to their core values. And so there's a lot of discomfort with well, I think. Eventually they did accept him as the vice presidential But I think you're right, a lot of people weren't happy with that convention. Nobody got a majority vote the first time around, so they went back and did it again. Did they really? That's awesome. That's great. Well, that can, you know, that can happen. I think it's cool to have. Yes, sir. And so there are technically four parties, including the, the Green Party. And yeah, I think Jill, might get four? Jill Stein may uh, run again. You know, uh, well, don't forget, in, in, in 2000, uh, Ralph Nader ran as the Green, I think, and, and cost. Uh, Democrats in this state say that Nader won so many votes in Florida that would have otherwise gone Gore that it cost the Democrats Florida and thus the election. So, um, you know, again, different parties have different, different states have different rules for ballot access. In some states, the Libertarian Party has earned ballot access and they go on automatically. 
In some states, the Green Party does. I think the Greens still get ballot access here. I think it's, maybe they don't. I think in our state, I don't remember this exactly, you have to, you, you, you're in kind of a limbo state. Uh, and if you get 3% in consecutive statewide elections, then you're on the ballot automatically. But if you drop below three twice in a row, then you're off the ballot. You've got to bring your way back on. It's very hard to get on it. The states do it their own ways. I mean, it's really kind of, it's an unusual system. But we, we've always honored the states to hold their own elections. It's part of our, our, our it's part of federalism, really. Yes? Can you give a sense of how many registered parties there are, and then also, I think your question was also, how do you register a party? Yeah. Yeah, and how do you, how do you register a party? Uh, legal requirements are different in every state. Oh, you, you yeah. register in the state. Yep, yeah. you register in the state, yeah. yeah. Yeah, originally, you know, the national committees, which are pretty powerful now, had very little power. They were just sort of a coalition of, of the state parties. Now that's changed over the years. But to start a party, we started in the state, to try and get ballot position in that state. Uh, and uh, was in New York a couple of years ago when the guy who get in, the guy got into base uh, uh, as part of some states are very liberal about who they on. So somebody got into debates in New York a few years ago uh, representing the rents too damn high part. Yes, <laughs> it was great. Yeah, yeah. rents too damn high. <laughs> that was his, that was his part. He was he got the debates on. A lot of states are a little stricter than that. Ours is very strict. Uh, New York, I think, recognizes the Democrats, the Republicans, the conservatives do pretty well. They get independence. And independence, is that right? I was going to say liberals. But yeah, so they recognize four different groups. But still, because of the way we're constructed, Democrats and Republicans have huge advantages. Don't ask a question, I have another one. Does anyone else have one? Alright, so um, I remember reading somewhere, hearing about it, that Republic, the positions of Republicans and Democrats switched at some point. Like, like a Republican today was actually a Democrat mm. 150 years ago. Can you explain Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Oh, they've changed over the years. Now, it, it takes an evolution of a process, but yeah, uh, you know, the, the party of, you know, party of Lincoln, the yeah, Republican was party, the, <laughs> was the party of racial liberalism for many, many years. And the Democrats were the party of racial conservatism because the Democratic Party was the party of the South. Do you ever hear the term the solid South? That doesn't mean, let's see if I can do this. Uh, the back arrows? Yeah, the back arrows. Uh, so, if you ever hear the term the solid South, it, yeah, that's good. It doesn't mean this. Now that's solidly red, and then the solid Republican, and that's the South, okay? What people say when they mean the solid South historically is the South was democratic. Mm -hmm. Solidly democratic. It was because of slavery. Okay? And then, you know, you're beginning to the 30s, FDR turns out to be pretty good for poor people, and uh, a lot of them are African Americans. And then, within the Democratic Party, you begin to get civil rights reforms in the 40s and the 50s. And in the 60s, the Democrats passed, with Republican help, by the way, Northern Republican help, uh, passed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and boom, the Democrats are the body of racial liberalism. So this change takes a long time. Did Wilson have a lot of Wilson was pretty racist. I'm not sure if he had much. No, no. There's a wonderful letter. This has happened many times in American politics, several times in American politics. There's a wonderful letter Abraham Lincoln wrote. Uh, he, was, he was invited here in 1859 to give his speech. The, the Boston Republicans asked him here. And Lincoln writes this wonderful letter saying that the two parties have changed in their view of liberty over the years. You know, it used to be the Jefferson Party that was the party of liberty. and. Uh, and, uh, but now that's not the case. He said, it's like two, he wrote this wonderful letter, he said, just the, he said, it's like two men meeting on a street, both of them drunk, and they get into a fight, mm -hmm. which because they're inebriated is a rather harmless fight, but after rolling around for a bit, they, they stand up and one is wearing the, the, the other person's coat, and the second is wearing that guy's coat, and they just change their coats. It's the only thing that happened. 
right, in the fight. And that's what happened with the parties. You know, the party of Jefferson was the party of liberty, and now we the Republicans are. You know, they, the, the Democrats of the party of Jefferson have turned into the party that is not for liberty. And we're the party of liberty. So it's happened over the years uh, a few times. And parties, you know, uh, party coalitions change. I mean, Democrats for many years uh, were, uh, did very well with Christian evangelicals uh, in the South. Jimmy Carter was a Christian evangelical, very, very well. But starting in 1980, that, you know, because of social issue changes, the Democrats were liberal uh, on abortion, became liberal on, on, on gay rights issues, um, and Christian evangelicals began to turn against prayer in schools. They, it was a community that felt besieged. And again, you know, this is one of the things the Republicans have promised them over the years is we're going to help you with this, we're going to help you with this, and they've lost every time on social issues. Uh, and so there's a lot of unhappiness there. But coalitions change. Yeah. Yeah, parties do change. Yes. Um, so I'm curious, uh, unrelated to, to the last question, but um, yeah, it seems so many of the Republican Party leaders just were not um, enthusiastic with any of the endorsements of Trump, to, to say the least. And I just, I, I, I find it kind of hard to swallow. It feels just incredibly hypocritical to like to go for it anyway when it's not their values, and I just don't think anybody they actually want representing them. It, it's just, just because they hate the Democratic platform so much they'd rather put somebody there? Is this a play for the future um, to protect them from like being, you know, chastised by the, the, the party? You know, wh how, do you, how, how do you take that? Because it, it just it bothers me so much. <laughs> uh, part of it has to do with the polarization of the country. They really, they really do dislike Democrats, and they really do dislike Hillary Clinton. Senator Lindsey Graham, a really conservative senator from South Carolina, but an independent thinking guy. Uh, had something interesting to say recently. He said, you know, at some point, love of country has to triumph over hatred of ability. Uh, you know, uh, but other people see it differently. I mean, I, you know, Paul Ryan is kind of in a box. Uh, he is the he is the leader of the House Republicans, the Speaker, and you know, he gives every indication of not liking Donald Trump much. But you know. As a party guy, you kind of hang in there in some ways. Others are not doing that. Charlie Baker won't go to the convention. Others won't go. You know, and Ryan is an ambitious guy. He'd like to be president. And you're looking at this saying, you know, if I if I if I turn my back on Donald Trump, these people are coming back in the party and they're never going to vote for me. And there go my ambitions. And that's part of it too. So there's a lot going on there. But it's it's an interesting thing how how many. Prominent Republicans are not even going to the convention. There won't be a Bush at the convention. Romney won't be at the convention. Mm. You know, it's, it's really an unusual situation. I, I assume this is not the first election where people in the party act, like actively dislike the no. the candidate that is put forward by the party. Like, do you do you have a, like some historical context of other examples of? There's no. I can imagine like you know a letter written by somebody about Lincoln. Yeah, I, there's never been anybody like this. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's completely unique. Parties after a hot fuck primary always have divisions, and part of part of the convention is to bring people together and smooth it all out and say, okay, we had our fight. We got, you know, that's what the Democrats did yesterday with Sanders and Bozeman. Uh You need some time to heal. Uh, this is different. People, you know, really feel that uh, he doesn't represent what the party believes in a lot of ways. They find him odious. You know, many of them find him to be an odious person, bad person, and they don't want to be associated with him. So he provides more complications than others uh, do. Lincoln was an accidental president, by the way. He wasn't the choice, the first choice of his party. He was sort of everybody's second choice, and they, I think it was on the fourth ballot he got the number. <laughs> Accidental present. Do you think we need this system, or it is like a direct democracy? Why is that such a bad idea? Well, you have to restructure the whole constitution. Uh, this is the this is the system the founders bequeathed us. It's developed over the years, but as long as we have an electoral college, uh, you know, we won't. We'll have an electoral college. We, you know, the founders didn't believe in direct democracy, for one thing. 
they thought, uh, you know, they looked at what was going on in the states. Uh, and they considered what was going on in the states to be a real threat. They thought a lot of people had gained too much power, uh, that didn't, shouldn't have power, uh, that the states were willy-nilly rejecting uh, a debt, uh, that they were poorly operated. Uh, and, you know, they didn't believe in the elitists of King George, but they didn't believe that the unschooled people could simply run things either. They sort of believed in an elite, but it would be an elite of continental characters who had proven themselves. And so uh, it's, it was never intended to be a direct democracy. No. So the so the constitution's in our way. Exactly. What do you think about you know secession? Brexit just happened. Mm -hmm. I saw a leak for a New Hampshire exit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what do you think? You know, what, 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 what can you tell me about that? You know, my fr my my friend and colleague Erin O'Brien went to her paper in Texas a few years ago. She went wandering by the state house as they were having a secession rally at the state house. Um, yes. I, I don't think we'll get to it. I mean, we had a civil war over it. You know, and uh, yeah, I don't think we want to go through that again. So I, I don't really see that happening. New Hampshire, every while, once in a while, some people up there decide they want to secede. Texas is big on secede. Um, but I, you know, it would be enormously complicated. I mean, how can we, you know, it would affect so many things. It just, I don't think it'll, I don't, you know, well, I don't say, I'd say like to say nothing will ever happen. It's highly unlikely uh, that anything like that would happen. They're just saying it could. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, it, it, I used to say Trump couldn't happen, so I guess I have to accept my yeah, fallibility. Uh, but I don't think that will happen. No. No, I think so. Yes? Does that, how many electors does it say Alaska has? Uh, Alaska has three. Okay. One congressperson, two senators. Yeah. Everybody gets, you know, everybody gets at least three. You may have more moose than people, it doesn't matter. You get two senators. And again, this is a constitutional uh, part, of, part of the compromise made at the, con at the Constitutional Convention was that every state would get two delegates. Uh, we're really to represent the state interests. And then you get uh, proportional. Depending on the, you know, how many, you know, what your population is, you get that number of uh, Congresspersons. Plus, of course, three fifths of your slaves count <laughs> in the original Constitution. <laughs> so, if you got a million slaves like South Carolina, that's another six hundred thousand people. Boy, that's another couple of congressmen. Great, right? Yes. So, I don't really know all that much about what happens at a convention. You talked a little bit about it. A lot of drinking. What you said? A lot of drinking. A lot of drinking. So the, the only thing I really know is I watch House of Cards. And there's, you know, everyone who watches House of Cards are all standing up and they're with the gavel and the people yeah. from the states are saying things and everyone's clapping and cheering. And that's probably just what they want us to believe is happening. Yeah. But it sounds like what you said is actually it doesn't happen at all. Not anymore, everything no. is decided, decided beforehand. Yeah. So there isn't any like states calling out who they nominate or anything. They will do that for the presidential nominee because they like to get to, and they'll set it up so that the deciding votes will be cast by the state of New York because that's where Donald Trump is from. And coincidentally, also the way Hillary Clinton is. So they will have that, you know, they will call the states and, you know, the state party chair will get up and say, you know, uh, the great nutmeg state of Connecticut casts its 89, about 89 delegates for the next president of the United States. Don't worry about where the party is. And then you'll get to the party and, and the, you know, the New York will, 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 will do their little speech and announce that all, how many of the delegates are voting for their candidate. And, uh, and people will realize if they, they don't do the up on the board or something, that this is the number that it takes to go over the amount to be nominated. And now we have a nominee people who chair. There'll be bunting, there'll be, there'll be balloons, there'll be people in the funny hats. Uh, they'll be, you know, holding the signs and going wild and so forth. But it's really sort of a main TV production at this point. That's why it's kind of important. So I'm sure House of Cards does a better job of uh, making it exciting, but it's not really exciting. You know, if you go back, God, 68, unfortunately, but years, even years before that, uh, when conventions really did make decisions, this would be on, you know, from whatever time they gavel the convention open. On, on the day, the networks, and there were only three at the time, would cover the whole thing. Because stuff would go on. 
Now the networks will give you, 10 o'clock at night will go to, the first night is going to be the keynote speaker, the second night will be somebody else, the third night will be our vice presidential, and Thursday night will be the nominee. But they'll only cover it for an hour, because not a lot goes on. Uh, now, cable will cover it, and cable will have, you know, that's more selective. C-SPAN will cover the whole thing. Uh, but not a lot of the law. And so it becomes less interesting because we're not going to have the spikes that we see. Them. I've never seen House of Cuts, but they have like really colorful stuff on floors. I mean, I used to go to conventions. We'd have fist fights. I had a friend who had a knife ball on the floor. We'd hit each other with signs and stuff, you know. It would get really wild on the floor. Not, not national conventions, but you know, it could get pretty crazy. Uh, but that stuff doesn't happen. Yes? If I were to pluck Hillary's name, Donald's thing in there. Wouldn't, I be pretty, wouldn't it be pretty clear who's going to win? Now that Sanders has. Um, well, yeah. To yeah, because most of those states that are dark blue and dark red are going to go uh, the same way just about every time. Um, you know, Trump is in such difficult. Utah, which is a solidly Republican state, Clinton might not be hit. Mormons cannot stand off. So, um, but you know, most of those states are going to remain uh, where they are, and a couple of them may flip this year. You know, they have a little more. Uh, you know, North Carolina is Obama won. You know, it's a southern state, but Obama won it in 2008. Narrowly lost it in 2012. Narrowly. You know, so you know, we'll see what happens there. But yeah, most of those states aren't going to change. So that's actually it's 8 o'clock, so that's the time that we have today. I don't know about you, I learned a lot tonight. I feel like I know my country so much better than before. And I have the same experience now that I do with almost every civic series, is I learn a lot, but I also learn about how complicated the rest of the whole world is. So I learn all the things that I don't know that I need to learn more about. So please join me in thanking Mo. Thank you. Terrific questions. They really yeah. were. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to me. This, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is really enjoyable. We have filmed this, so we will eventually get it in a little bit and then put it online. Reminder about our next event on Brexit, August 18th. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get an email about it. If you're not on our mailing list, you sign up for this event. We'll put your email address down there. We'll make sure you get on it. We have little surveys that we ask everyone to fill out. We read each and every one. We love them. We make a big event out of them. If you can make sure you fill one out, just put one right there. That'll be great. Um, am I missing anything else, Rachel? Food. Oh, yeah, we have some food. So feel free to stick around. We might we'll get you that right away. So if you're chat, and Mo said he'd stop, stick around for a little yeah. longer, too. All right, thank yeah. you. Yeah.